when I was 18, I, there was a guy in my town driving a Lamborghini and like lives in like the rich neighborhood of the thing. And so I kind of had it set in my mind. I'm like, I'm not going to university. I'm going to follow him around until I get a job. Like trying to be not too creepy, but probably a little creepy. But yeah, hundred percent. Josh, what's up, man? Not much. Excited Dude, to be here. I'm excited for this conversation. Uh, founder of a stated serial entrepreneur, real estate investor, um, incredibly fast runner. Uh, I've had the privilege of running with you to help set my pace, increase my steps per minute. I'd say it's um, the other way around. But Dude, you're you. so fast. I, uh, <laughs> you, were, you were talking like normal at my fastest pace. I was like, okay, this is not going to work. Um, but uh, let's talk about this entrepreneurial journey. A stated uh, real estate data. Um, what, what does it do? Who do you work with? What does the company look like today? Yeah. So we've been collecting property record data from like public record sources, which is a pretty ugly, boring job for about seven years now. And so I became fascinated with real estate probably when I was like 23. I kind of had a you look 23 now, dude. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, but it was, I had a, uh, a family friend who I noticed had just generated a lot of wealth in real estate, owned properties all over the world. That is actually how I ended up in Kelowna. I stayed in an apartment of his that he just let me stay in at the college when I first came here. And so I was fascinated with real estate pretty early into my entrepreneurial journey. And previous to that, I had been running a bunch of digital, digital advertising for Carfax. And so I kind of understood the Carfax model. I thought it would apply to real estate and it did. And so were you an affiliate for Carfax? Yeah, exactly. Oh, cool. And so then that's we, how you got the demand gen marketing know-how and then wanted to do it for real estate. And my love is like Google AdWords and analytics. That's where I spend most of my time, especially when I was first getting into this. That was like my passion. I still love it today. And yeah, it's been seven year journey now. And it started kind of B to C where we just did these single car faxes for homes. But as that grew over the first few years and we got like thousands of subscribers using it. Was that called a stated back then? No, it was called data nerds. Data nerds. Yes. And that was Carfax for homes. Yep. Is that what you, cause I, you also went into Techstars. Is that what you went to Techstars with or that was a stated? So Techstars, when we gave them equity, took uh, equity in both. Okay. ideas. Um, and that was generating quite a bit of revenue at that time. So I got a really good deal with tech stars. Um, but yeah, they have equity in both businesses. So it's mm -hmm. kind of the consumer side and our B2B side, but we pitched the B2B side for it because our data expenses were so much at that time from like these huge players, like first American black Knight, core logic. And so we pitched to them, we think we could go collect this information and do it ourselves. And we don't have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars every year, which each with each provider. And so that was kind of how the estated idea came to be. And it's been a grind for three years. This has not been a walk well, in the park. Well, how does the data collection work? I mean, do you have to build relationships with all these different counties? And exactly. Are you North America? It's like We're only in the US right now. Okay. Public record data in Canada is a lot stricter mm -hmm. than it is in the US. There's a lot more freedom. There's the Freedom of Information Act in the US where we can actually send that to a county or city office and they have to give us all the information on the properties. What format are they giving it to you in? <sighs> CD-ROM sometimes. What? Yeah. We have yet to get a floppy disk, um, but we literally have CD-ROMs delivered to us on a monthly and quarterly basis from some of these counties. And PDF scans? What are yep. they? Yep. It's really ugly. So how do you get that into a digital format? Do you we have, have to manually do it. Manual. Yeah. Not even We OCR. outsource a lot of okay. that and we do have a lot of OCR okay. in the outsourcing, but yeah. Um, yeah, it's ugly. Dude. But I mean, hard problems mean opportunity and a moat. Um, what have you learned about building this company over the last, you know, especially on the stated side, the B2B side, you know, what have you, you know, even managing a tech team? Because if you're, if you're a marketer, I mean, the whole building products, this whole other world. How have you learned that? What are some of the challenges around that? Well, going B2B is a totally different conversation from B2C. One of the things that I constantly just kind of tell our salespeople too is like our average sales cycle is 75 days on the B2B side. The B2C is 90 seconds. 
and it's a you know two hundred dollar lifetime value of a user. We pay a certain CPA, and you can just rinse and repeat over and over and over again. You don't really have to be too creative with it. With the B two B and the tech side, you actually have to teach people to integrate APIs. You have to teach them how to navigate big bulk data sets. It's pretty ugly and boring, but that's where the opportunity is. And I think over the last year, we finally started to see it pan out. The first two years of Estated was really rocky. It's right after we got venture capital from Foundry, and we pretty much went all in on collecting and cleansing the data, we had no idea what we were doing. And I hired like 20 engineers to work on it. Burn rate went way up. And when we went to market, it completely failed. So there's a lot of stories within that. Yeah, talk about those. I mean, what were the assumptions versus the realities? Well, the assumption was that there's 3,144 counties in the United States. There's probably one or two sources in each of them that record public record data that we would have to get to. And if we built the tooling to you know, have those relationships, the data would just come in however often they updated it, we would be able to standardize it and build the, you know, basically machine learning to pull in those data sets, get them all cleaned up, and then import them into our own. There's a lot of guessing in that. There's a lot of issues with that. And so our first attempt at it, we spent about two and a half million dollars and we got about 70 million properties. There's about 150 million properties in the United States. And so we did okay, but the problem was, is we kind of burned through all of our cash. So and is it one of those things where incomplete data sets aren't valuable or cause then all of a sudden, you know, if somebody wants data on a thing, they're not 50% coverage doesn't sound doesn't work. Yeah. I always joke about data companies just in general. It's not big data that's important. It's the buzzword. It's what everyone says is important, but it's actually like the small actionable data that adds value to your business is what you have to deliver to people. And so we're starting to see that now. It's not about giving someone all 150 million properties. It's the 10 million properties with pools that your company is going to service that we know how the size of the pool, when the pool was installed and you know, when it needs maintenance or something along those lines. There's very small pieces of data that we need to be able to pull out to create value for the businesses we work with. And so, you know, the first few attempts at selling it was just like the more the merrier. As we get more specific and we learn more about our users, it's actually those really small pieces and then being able to deliver them in like the format that they needed as well. So whether that's in, you know, Excel files or it's in an API, it just depends. How do you right size the business after spending two and a half million dollars and hiring 20 engineers? Well, the funny thing about you asked the question of what adversities have you went through. And so, yeah, I did my first layoff. I vividly remember this like March 10th of 2019. Arguably the 2019 was the worst year for the business. 2020 came as a breeze though, which was kind of nice. Yeah. Yeah, Because a lot of people had a rough 2020. What happened in 2019? If you could walk us through that, how did, how did it feel? (sighs) Well, so it would have been January 2018. We got the 3 million from Foundry. You're kind of a hot shot when you come back to Kelowna from Techstars with a few million dollars from a tier one venture capital firm. So I was a little bit enamored in that, you know, lots of talking to people, not really focusing on my business as much. We were scaling. We knew what we needed to do. We weren't sure we could do it. I think the measurements and KPIs that we had were a little out to lunch. And after about, I'd say, yeah, it was a year and a bit, a year and a quarter in March, we went to sell the entire data set to Remax and Compass. Both deals fell through. And that day, the lead on that project, who had about 10 staff, I ended up firing. No, we, we had to fire his entire team and he quit. And that was a really rough day. As a leader, it was a really rough day because there was a lot of instability for the next six months. So we were 32 people, I think. So within one day, we went down to 19 um, after letting all those people go, which was really, really tough. Um, First time entrepreneur, first time running a business. All this is new to me. After coming off the high of being, you know, feeling like you had the special touch. Exactly. And the business before the like Carfax for Homes had always performed really well for the first three years. Like running that business was a breeze for me. I never had to hire really technical people. It was more like customer support and staff. So now I had a bunch of really smart technical people, had to let them go after working with them for a year and a bit. And 
it, it hurt the confidence. It hurt a lot of the leadership qualities. I think I've grown a lot from it. We had an employee who's moving on and let me know last week. And I asked for feedback just on like, what did you think about me as a leader of this company? And his feedback was so dramatically different than the feedback that I had gotten in 2019. I was like really proud of myself. Um, what, did, yeah. what did you work on? Well, you asked about a few books that really helped me. There's probably two that I think stand out the most for me. The Effective Executive by Peter Drucker. Mm. Um, I think I've really learned to manage my time better. I managed to, f you know, focus on my strengths and not as much on my weaknesses. And then the second book, which is arguably the most important, and I reread it this year, was The Speed of Trust by Stephen Covey. Um, and so having to redevelop trust in an uh, environment where you've broken it all is a really challenging thing. And so I kind of looked at it as my favorite analogy was, you know, trust is like a glass full of water. You know, you, you add little drops to it and it's full. It takes forever to fill up, but it takes five seconds to knock it over. I think there's a Warren Buffett quote about that too. It takes a lifetime to build a reputation and an instant to ruin it. And so, you know, it's been a couple of years now and I feel like I've completely changed. And the feedback that came from this employee was really, really good. Uh, really happy with the company culture, really happy with my participation. And I felt like a lot of those practices that I'd read about, I finally were putting into play. Um, it takes a long time though, a lot of hard work too. You have to look in the mirror and, and face some of the, your weaknesses and some of those things that you're not good at. And that's a good learning experience for me. Do you have any co-founders to kind of be the yin to your yang in those situations? Like I have a number two who owns about 10% of the company. Mm. Um, but when I first started my entrepreneurial journey, um, I went 50, 50 with someone didn't work out. And so the second time around, um, I gave 10% to my technical, you could call him a co-founder. Um, but yeah, total yang to my yang, complete opposite human been my friend for over a decade though. Ups and lots of ups and downs through it all, but we're still, we're still working on it. And what is it about doing B2B that, that you've had to discover and figure out from a go to market point of view that was different? The sales process is significantly different. You know, when you're doing that direct to consumer stuff, it's instant. There's no sales support there. So that's one of the reasons we're huge fans of SaaS Academy is like the on, like kind of that, the discovery side of things was something we were never very good at. We're getting a lot better. Like we hacked our way to a little over a million and a bit in revenue last year, but we know that this is a probably $25 million a year business. When we look at our competitors, the market, who we can work with. Um, and so, now we're really starting to implement a lot of these things from SaaS Academy on like the prospecting side of things to actually running them through a true sales funnel and then actually getting to closing and onboarding. And actually our customer success is just mind boggling to me right now. The amount of people that get started with Estated and don't leave, our retention is really high. Our churn is really low. And yeah, the B2B side of sales is just, it's a huge process compared to the world I came from. Totally different. Um, in regards to, um, cause I've got this image in my mind of the Josh that came back from tech stars and, you know, cause I, I grew up in a small town and I remember moving to the Valley and raising venture capital and, you know, you just feel like, wow, I've, I've done something that very few people can do, especially at a young age. Um, and you know, it's easy to get distracted. And you see a lot of these founders that are always out at events, they're being recognized, especially in Canada. There's a lot of like, honestly, if you apply, you'll probably win kind of awards and different oh, things. Oh yeah, it's really yeah, yeah. easy. Like there's the, the, the filters and the criteria isn't as high. They just really want to recognize anybody. Um, you know, and it sounded like you had to, to eat a slice of humble pie um, when kind of those grand visions didn't work out. You know, what, if you're going back now, what would you have done differently? say no to a lot more things. I think you really hit it on the, on the nail there. Um, there's so many distractions. Your time is so valuable. And another great kind of like learning for me was, um, kind of when COVID did hit and we went work from home, I've spent my whole life working in an office. Even when I was like 19 and went to my first advertising job, um, I was in an office from, you know, 7 30 AM till six or seven at night. And I kind of emulated that and my boss there and I brought it to Kelowna and I did that here, got an office like right away, was there all day, every day, six, seven days a week. And it was just kind of like the way that it was. 
And so I think once tech stars happened, a big thing that I had to get come to like grips with was a, I was in Boulder for four and a bit months. So I didn't know what my team was doing here. I didn't know what the work ethic was like. I completely lost pulse on that. And then when I came home, I was kind of like more comfortable with that. And so I wouldn't have been more comfortable with that when I came home, but Were then you I spending more time, not at the office. Yeah, exactly. Ah. And so now that COVID hit and all, or I guess we had to go work from home in the last year. And so many tech companies have went work from home and digital and remote. Now I actually look at it as an advantage and it f- has forced me to a measure my time better, focus my time better. And there's so many more things that I've been able to do in the last year and a half since working from home. And I've been incredibly more productive and the results speak for themselves. And so what, what do you say no to now? What's change around how you manage your time? I definitely don't take as many just like random VC calls as many, like just, you know, do you want to chat about X, Y, Z business opportunity? Like none of those things when they hit my inbox, I don't, I, I might respond pretty curt, candidly, just get it over with. But yeah, I don't really like to open my calendar up to too many people, to be honest. And that's different than it was before. I would have said yes to anything yeah. and every opportunity that ever Who wants to talk. Up. Oh yeah, let's, let's go. go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, in regards to some, you mentioned a few books. Is there any other books that have kind of shaped your thinking around personal development or entrepreneurship that, that have been meaningful for you? Well, the Bible for me is um, Measure What Matters. Yeah, I'll put this away. Uh, Measure What Matters by John Dewar. We, Techstars did teach us about OKRs. Our entire company runs on OKRs now, and I love them so much. And it's allowed me a lot of freedom, especially with now that we work from home, with the fact that I can just set an objective, put key results, put dates with them, and I can just trust my people to measure themselves against them. And now it's actually at a stage where my best leaders are stepping up and they're doing them themselves. And so Measure What Matters, I think, is kind of a Bible for us. Um, Predictable Revenue, another great one for sales. I know that we have a whole Monday board right now of objectives that we're going to just be constantly implementing and split testing on the sales and success side with that. Um, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Yeah, Lencioni. Yeah, always a good one. You know, The Power Habit on Personal Development. I also just love biographies. Like I just read Stephen Schwarzman's again. Then you have... uh, Really anything by Walter Isaacson on Steve I'm just Jobs. reading his, uh, his Jeff Bezos one. It's pretty epic. Yeah, I haven't started that one yet. It's I'll good. have to get that. Um, Sam Zell. I can't remember Real what they- Real estate legend. Yeah, legend. Yeah. Um, anything on Buffett and Munger. I feel like Sam Zell we'd hang out with and we'd- in, like, He'd show up in we a leather get jacket. Him to claw. Yeah, we gotta get him to claw. <laughs> I'm, I'm putting that on my like, I want to get him from Chicago to Kelowna and to hang out. I think he would love the energy and the vibe. Um, but you know, when did your journey start as a, as a reader? Like, how did that, how'd that come to be? Well, I only have like a high school education. And then when, so kind of like when I was 18, I, there was a guy in my town outside of Edmonton that was like two or three years older than me. I'd seen him at track meets and stuff throughout the years, went to a high school, I grew up in town of like, I don't know, 60, 70,000 people. And he's like driving a Lamborghini and like lives in like the rich neighborhood of the thing. And so I kind of had it set in my mind. I'm like, I'm not going to university. I'm going to follow him around until I get a job. And I worked with him for a while. And how did you get that job? Literally like just followed him around. Like trying to be not too creepy, but probably a little creepy. But yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. And I started in customer service. who's selling lots of like total digital advertiser. Uh, I learned a lot from that guy, but, um, avid reader, super hard worker. And so I guess it would have been like 18, 19 when I really started picking up books. And then once I got into entrepreneurship, when I was like 23, 24, I just realized there was always a solution in them. And when you come across a book at the right time in your life, there's a, that's a really good feeling. And so I spend at least a couple hours a day reading and it's just, it's part of the routine. That's amazing. So you, you see this guy that you know, has the car, lives in the big house. No idea how, why. Yeah, I want to <laughs> learn from him. But this is a good point. I mean, you decide to go work with him. And then through osmosis, watching him execute, you see that he's not only a hard worker, but he's educating himself. And, you know, that's a big part of your life. Um, is there other people that have kind of shaped your your entrepreneurial journey that, you know, and, and how did they, what did you learn from these people? 
There's lots. Well, number one, I'd probably put Jason Mendelson from Foundry. Like I kind of did the same thing with Foundry. Like when we got out of Techstars, we had multiple venture offers, but I was like, I want Foundry. I want Jason Mendelson. He taught me a lot. Brutal honesty delivered kindly is like something that like a motto that I'll, I'll never forget. Um, he was the fastest response. He never took more than 60 seconds to respond to an email. I don't know how he did it. He was an extremely popular CEO of Foundry Group. He could respond to an email in less than two minutes, 24 hours a day. Um, I don't know how he did that. Brad Feld as well. I love reading anything about Brad Feld, even the way he speaks and talks about kind of like the, just the landscape of the world is fascinating. Larry Smith from Kelowna, um, Accelerate Okanagan, uh, Fraser Campbell, all of these people help shape me. I'm totally like a chameleon too. like put me in with these people and I'll learn and absorb as much as I can. And I'll, I'll take a, a lot away from it. It's one of the reasons I kind of got connected with you as well. So as soon as I kind of saw the SaaS thing, I was like, oh, this is what we need. We don't know how to run a B2B company. We need coaches and we need to be surrounded by companies that are doing this and we'll learn fast enough. We might not be the fastest, but we'll get there. And yeah, then there's just also people that you never meet, but that become mentors. You can, yeah, you can read afar. about them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's the biggest surprise you've had building your tech companies that you assumed was different when you started versus how it really is? That's a good question. Well, I think <laughs> one of the things I thought, I thought engineering was arguably the most measurable thing ever mm. and data was the most measurable thing ever. But when you really get into it, it there's often, well, as kind of everything, there's always two sides to the story and it's kind of how you perceive it and how you look at it. Like one thing can mean something to this person and totally different to the other person. And so you kind of have to, I think I used to be really fast to jump to conclusions when my engineering team would give me responses. And now I'm more at a point where it's like, I kind of feel like there's always another side to it. And it's allowed me to kind of be less decisive on a lot of matters within the company, growing the tech side. Like, for example, we might be evaluating a data set um, from like one provider versus the other provider. And like, you know, we will have debates on our team of which one is better and why. And it's really hard to choose. Nowadays, we kind of just will buy both um, and figure it out because that's the way I see my company going. It's like the more the merrier. We'll do that part, but it's the small part that we can sell to someone where we become value add. Um, but I used to be pretty decisive about what I thought was right and wrong. And now I just, it's just always a learning curve. <laughs> just keep absorbing as much as you can and form an opinion. But very rarely are you going to be like perfect. It's not binary. It's interesting. Yeah. It's, it's essentially getting to a point where the initial, your, your initial response isn't as um, poignant. Like it's like knowing that there's more and you just don't know what it is. So you don't have to like treat it as fact. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I mean, that's a, a lot of founders, I think, struggle with the fact that um, they are reactive, right? And very. Yeah. And I mean, there is two sides and there's the quant and there's the qualitative side of it. And there's the kind of like, what's the right decision for the short term versus long term? Um, you know, as you've developed as a leader, um, what are kind of some of the ways that you have changed the way you build your culture and communicate with your staff to? to try to, you know, gain that trust back. As you mentioned, you, you felt like you kind of lost. Yeah. Culture is a great thing. I, I don't remember who told me this, but it's like, it's a direct reflection of the CEO, the culture of the company. It bleeds down. And if you're having issues with it, like the best place you can look is in the mirror, in my opinion. And then the next place you have to look is your leadership team and what's going on there. With the stated and data nerds, the things that we've done that have been really valuable and we're constantly experimenting with these things, but one that's stuck through is a thing we called Retrotude and it's every Friday at 3 p.m. and it's a uh, retrospective and gratitude together. When we had the office, we literally had Kleenex boxes with post-it notes on them that you could drop little gratitudes in. And on Friday at 3 p.m., we would sit down as a team and read them gets really hard when you go virtual. So now it's, and you kind of have to pry it a little bit more because it's not throughout the week, people would just put them in and then they'd come up again. Um, that's one thing that's been amazing for our culture, for people to get to know, know each other too. And just to say thank you to each other. Um, another thing we've been doing is kind of like, we just do a weekly hour meeting and we either do like a 15 or minute video on YouTube about mindset or mental health or something going on in the company at that time. Maybe it's real estate or data 
maybe it's one of our com- like one of our clients that have raised a bunch of capital. Like we had Blend raise three hundred million, and half my staff didn't even know what Blend was. Um, you know, this company literally hits our API millions of times and they're like, what is this? I'm like, oh yeah, they're a multi-billion dollar company. That's, you know, going to go public here soon. And they love us. customer. Yeah. Yeah. They love us. I know you guys don't know that, but, um, so we do little things like that. Uh, and then, yeah, culture is just kind of like, I I think OKRs is, is we've made it really clear that this is how our company runs. We have like our onboarding is mostly just, you know, read, measure what matters. And, and this is how you're going to see our company run. And you have to get used to that. Yeah. So using the content to almost onboard and activate new hires and then see if they resonate with that or not. It's pretty quick, but we know that we have some core values. And I think the the most prominent one is you have to be able to thrive in autonomy. And I've really learned that just from me, I need autonomy. If you put boundaries around me that I don't agree with, it gets, it gets ugly for me. Um, and that's something I've had to go to therapy for, for a long time, but you learn a lot about yourself through that. And so, um, there, there's a lot of autonomy in our company. We don't want to have tons of meetings. I don't think like, you know, Foundry has this thread going on right now about death by meeting. Like when you go virtual and you have a team of 20, 30, 40, maybe a hundred people, that's a lot of meetings for a CEO. And so you have to learn how to get rid of those things. And autonomy has kind of been my best thing. And with OKRs, it's like, here's the objective of what we're trying to accomplish this month. Here's the key results and the dates that are attached to them that you need to deliver by. And if you have issues, we're here to help. Like, you know, my calendar is ready for anyone on my team at any time. But yeah, that's a, that's an interesting one. Yeah. It's ongoing. Never ends. It doesn't stop. And I think that's where as the CEO, we get the most leverage, right? Like how we show up for our team, setting that uh, cadence um, and also modeling. I mean, I think leadership, I think it was uh, Vince Lombardi or somebody said, you know, like it's not the only form, uh, the the best form of leadership is by example. And it's like the culture is going to be set from up top. Um, Josh, as we wrap up, I'd love to hear your answer to a question I ask all my guests, which is, you know, looking back again to the 20 year old version of you and, and the one that sits before me, um, who do you feel like you had to become to achieve the level of success you're at today? Who do I feel like I had to become? Yeah. What are those beliefs shifts that had to happen for you to be able to lead the team today? One thing that I'm, I'm proud of myself is through even the ups and downs, I've, I've managed to maintain a lot of that confidence. And as a CEO, you often get beat up. You have to take the blame. And if your company is failing, it's on you. It doesn't matter who you can't point the finger. If you point the finger, you look like shit. And I believe that so strongly. And so I'd say there's kind of the person that I I've become over the last, especially five years is I've become a lot more reflective. Um, maybe one of the reasons I could run so fast is because I typically run without music and I run a lot of hours during the week. I don't know how many, um, you ever, I used to be super data driven. I got to a point a couple of years ago, I was just like, I don't even care. Like, I just want to go out and run no headphones, no phone and unplug for a while. And so I've become a person where like, I reflect on everything pretty deeply now. And I love that two, three hours a day of silence that I can get, um, just to be with myself. And so it's allowed me to be more productive. It allows me to listen better to other people, absorb that information. And I wasn't like that in my 20s. More decisive, jump to the conclusion, just get this done, work really hard until it gets done. Now I'm really strategic on like, can we get this done faster, working smarter rather than working harder. And, you know, as you grow older, I think you don't try and rush the process as much. It starts, you, I feel a lot more comfortable now knowing that things aren't going to get, I mean, if it's going to be a day late, but I know it's going to be done properly, I, I'm okay with that. It used to drive me nuts. And so I think I've slowed down, learned to reflect a lot. And if I could have told myself that when I was 20, it's like, it's going to work out. That would have been a nice thing to know. That's interesting. So essentially, um, the understanding when to be patient, mm. knowing that, you know, if you can control it, you will, but a lot of stuff you can't. And then I think it's just even the discipline, um, that you talk about of just reflecting on action. A lot of entrepreneurs don't build that feedback loop. And I think that's what has set you apart amongst my clients. Honestly, Josh, you're somebody that's humble. You're willing to do the work. Um, you show up, uh, you're eager to learn, you're curious. Um, and those are things I think that, 
uh, other people want to follow. Your team wants to follow that. So it's been really cool watching that journey. Um, where do people find you on the internet? Estated.com. It's probably the best place. Josh had a stated if you want to chat. Right, you want to give people your email. I hope, yeah, everybody ask Josh for his time. We'll see if he says no. Someone on my team will give you their time. There we go. <laughs> He's got help. I uh, appreciate the time, Josh. Thanks, Dan. Awesome. Cheers.